Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic Olivia Williams to talk all about the HBO show, The Nevers. And I'm so curious with shows like this about the details that you need beyond the page, because there's such fantastical elements to it constructed into the story, which really, you know, affect your character in certain ways. And so what were some of the questions and conversations that you had early on beyond the pages of, of dialogue and beyond the pages of action in the scripts to really understand what this world was going to be on set and ultimately on screen? Um, I the, the questions were myriad. There were thousands of questions, uncountable questions. Um, unfortunately, I, I went with the writer to a restaurant to discuss my character and the piece to a lovely London restaurant before lockdown, uh, which has a terrible acoustic and he has a quite a quiet voice. And uh, he, he tended to begin the sentence, you know, the really interesting thing about your character is, and then, someone else would speak at another table or the way to arrive. And every time he got to the thing, I, I didn't hear what he said. And I made him repeat it about three or four times and then it just got embarrassing. And so I honestly took this job um, just knowing that my character was called Lavinia Bidlow and uh, that she was suffering a progressive disability and that it, uh, I think the two words I heard were Victorian superheroes. Um, and uh, it, it's my my faith in, in this writing and in this piece was that I took the job uh, on the basis of those two words. <laughs> and you've mentioned her disability and how that was the first time that you played a, a character with that experience in their life. And how did you want to determine her relationship with that? And did you view it as something that, you know, had been there with her her entire life or something that came from something along the way? Um, it, it was my first time depicting disability. I have had experience of it through friends and my father um, who became ill in, uh, towards the end of his life. And he had to wear a, a really alarming sort of frame. He got that form of osteoporosis where your the front of your body sort of caves in. And so he had a frame that was sort of holding him straight and his head back. And, and um, I went into the costume fittings, um, sort of asking for a costume that literally looked as if my neck was a sort of neck brace, a sort of support. And, and it, it all wasn't entirely wrong for the period to have these very high necks. And it almost looks, if you look at the costumes, as if my head is on a plate, um, sort of being served up at a table. And I wanted this idea that, that, that everything about her is, is, is holding her up and that she's almost a, a, a sort of brain being wheeled about um, in, in a costume and on a chair. And, um, and that she has every facility for thinking and feeling and being good and bad, good and evil, um, uh, uh, but that her body uh, is, is sort of crumbling away underneath her. Um, but it made very, me very aware of disability politics. Um, you know, my, my character would just magically appear in, in rooms where none of the doors were wide enough for my chair to get through. <laughs> and, and, I, and there was a scene, uh, the burial of a character which was in the middle of a muddy field. And I was meant to go forward and drop rose petals onto the coffin. But um, because my wheels ran into the mud, you know, that, that bit of the scene was cut. Um, and uh, I got a, an, a very, very tiny taste and impression of the things that people with a disability or in a wheelchair are, are excluded from just because nobody's got the time or effort to, to make it happen. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, it made me, extremely incensed and um, empathetic um, about something which I, I would have said before that I understood and uh, realized that I had no no understanding of at all. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that was a fascinating journey for me. But in terms of, of the character, um, I also felt that, feel that, um, you know, that there's the same spectrum of personality 
within people who have a disability as in any other section of society and to assume that she is to be pitied or that she is her charity is entirely selfless um, it may not be the case uh, just because she has a disability it doesn't mean she's a nice person <laughs> There's also an immense level of fortitude and strength in her as a character in so many different ways, particularly in a patriarchal society. Um, and so what are the ways in which you had to think about the construct of that in terms of an exterior performance very differently? You know, because you can't rely on movement of your body and stature in the same way. So then instead you're thinking more about looks and the tone of her voice and different assertions to express that. I think she's very confident um, about about sounding authoritative. Um, and I think that she uses uh, uh, the other accoutrements available to her in terms of a very grand chair and an extremely patronizing tone uh, to, to stay one step ahead of anybody she's speaking to. So she's not frightened of Lord Masson who, who uses, um, his maleness and his class and the way he speaks to intimidate people but she makes it clear that um that she is not to be intimidated and she and she also has a way of managing augie um that that belies i think her her love for him and her her desire to protect him um but yes she she has sort of uh, cauterized her her fluffy side she also has a beautifully dry sense of humour where she'll say something and it's almost five minutes later when you suddenly realise that that was absolutely hilarious. Um, and so how did you really work to play around with a lot of the text to find that humour in her and, and to present it in that very kind of like almost underhanded way? It is in the writing and you have to learn Joss's uh, uh, wording to the syllable. Um, correctly and then it, it does it itself but it is hard it is convoluted and um it's a bit like playing the piano it's like muscle memory you literally have to say it again and again and again um not necessarily engaging your brain um to say the words in the right order and then they say themselves they they do the work honestly but um you know with um, preceding age and the number of things going on in one's head with, with life, um, it gets harder and harder to learn lines. And, you know, these are lines you have to sit and drill um, and, and trust that they will make sense in, on the day. And you mentioned before her relationship with her brother, Augie, and that's a really fascinating dynamic between the two of them because it goes beyond the, the power dynamic between the two of them and even down to she's the older sibling, but she's the one who's received the family wealth and is in charge of everything. Um, and like you said, there's that protectiveness, but we don't know if it's protecting him or protecting others mm -hmm. ever as well so there's that dance to play around with and so what are the ways in which you and Tom Riley worked together and really thought about well what is the history that's led to this particular dynamic when it comes to the power what is it that led to her family you know bestowing the money towards her um the way we prepared he's a very entertaining very nice chap and um he, you know in a way it's, he's one of these people who who's moved from from the world I'm still in to into the LA world. And, and I've, I've been on both sides of that experience. So we just had some very funny conversations of the journey from Rochester to, um, to Los Angeles. Um, and on the very first day, uh, we discovered that wheeling that unwieldy wheelchair over gravel uh, was extremely hard work for him. <laughs> and we, we had to, go along a path and then stop and reset. So there was a tracking shot. And uh, on, after the first journey, I sort of sat in my chair and they said back to ones. And I sort of sat there and sort of waved my hand as if he was going to put me back. And he was like, no, <laughs> you need to get out of the chair and walk back because <laughs> I'm not pushing you. And, and that kind of set the scene. It was like, OK. <laughs> Um, the fact that I'm in charge is in fact imaginary um, and uh, only during the take. Um, but uh, no, he's very good fun and a very generous man. And I, I know actually later we're going to 
talk about my work for Pancreatic Cancer UK. And, and when you do a shout out and ask your famous friends to um, make a video or put something out on social media, you have to choose really carefully who you ask. And it's really interesting who steps up. And uh, he was one of the first people to, when I said, could someone just put out this message today in support of Pancreatic Cancer UK? And he, his, his brilliant video of him saying what I wanted him to say in front of a blank wall um, was back by, you know, within five seconds. He, he so, so, and I could, I'm not judging the people who don't find time because I'm very often the person that doesn't find time to come back um, in a millisecond, but it is to his credit that he did, and he always finds time for things like that. And um, that's a measure of what a great person he is. In terms of our relationship, um, yes, it's complicated, and it's com because there is a huge uh, spoiler which I cannot touch upon um, as to what. Uh, what the secret is of Augie's uh, personality. And, but she does, she knows that she needs to uh, keep him close and keep him safe. And you touched upon the costumes before and Michelle Clapton's created the most exquisite looks throughout the entire show. And, and I loved hearing that there was a moment where you actually said, I don't care if the camera even lands on me, just make sure that you take the time to really show off the details of this. And there's so much a part of building a character like Lavinia as well. And, and how does that help you in really forming who she is? And, and what, you know, especially once you step into it and you start looking at some of the minute details and what they tell you. Well, it, 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 may, it reinforces what I was saying about the disability because we had to build, her costumes fit perfectly. She's such a perfectionist. If there is a wrinkle, you would look at my sort of cast iron boobs. You know, it's just this kind of big front of metal. It's like the front of those iron buildings in New York. And, um, and if there's a wrinkle, you know, she can't bear it. it it's like physical pain to her. So we learned that I had to sit in the chair for the fittings and, and the process of getting the costume on me was, was some inkling of what daily preparation, what daily life is, is like when you have to be helped in and out of everything you do. So it was hugely influential um, in, in the making of the character in the making of Lavinia. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, is the period at the time, you know, was the time of machinery, but in, and so things were being woven by machines, but when you're sewing on beads and when you're making a hat with a dead bird in it, that is just creativity. That is just some incredibly gifted and patient and artistic person sitting for hours and sewing on beads and making a bunch of feathers look like a, a dead crow. I mean, she's, you know, she's extraordinary. Michelle is extraordinary, but she asks extraordinary things of her of her craftspeople. And there's everyone from glove makers to shoemakers to hat makers to dead bird makers. You know, it's it's a wonderful thing and something that's very moving about post COVID, you know, a lot of these arts are lost uh, if they're not used. And so f where theater is effectively dead at the moment, um, film can give these amazing creative people who make things with their hands um, an outlet for their creativity. And, you know, I'm very aware that your show is, is about, you know, is in creativity. It's, it, that's what it's about. And, uh, and so I think those people who are making things with their hands need a shout out. I mean, similarly, Gemma Jackson with all the production design and her team, there's again just such an exquisite level of detail in all of those locations. And we do get such an eye into your character's world in that way as well. You know, we get to start seeing some of the spaces inside of her home, but then even just the mention of, oh, you know, your estate, it's quite large, you know, so we know that we're only seeing tiny pockets of it. And so when you go into immersive locations like that, again, is it quite influential to you in terms of character detail? 
I wish I, li- I mean, we were filming at West Wickham. Have you ever been there? It's the most magical place. And there was a day, you know, the, this is why I love my job. While we're not shooting, we're sitting in, I don't know whether he's a Duke or an Earl or whether those are the same thing, but anyway, we're sitting in his kitchen with his view over his artificial lake with an Inigo Jones temple set on an island in the middle of a lake. And there was one night where the moon rose early and so bright that that our DP, um, you know, dropped everything and just went out and everyone was standing on the lawn looking across the lake at the moon reflected in the lake. I mean, I want to send you the photograph. And so, yeah, no, it's magical. But the other quite moving thing was uh, my my parents had to sell um, a house when my father died and I inherited a lot of large objects made of brown Victorian mahogany um, where in a modern flat there is not a lot of space or use or, or a husband that likes ancient mahogany furniture and so with some sadness in my heart I sold some of my um, grandmother's furniture to the production but knowing that it would be loved and used i um i don't think uh, my grandmother's sewing box has turned up on on my set yet but um i live in hope <laughs> really beautiful to be able to watch the show in that way yeah one of the personality traits as well that i was also really interested in was that moment where there's a conversation between lavinia and augie and he's essentially accusing her of always assuming the worst in people and her response isn't to be defensive about it. It's actually to lean into it and to just say, well, I'm rarely disappointed. And so it feels like she is someone who goes into situations and new interactions with a certain level of cynicism and reticence. And so when you take a detail like that, what are the ways in which it informs so many interactions for you, whether it's with people that she knows extensively or whether it's the first time that she's having a conversation with someone? I mean, I- what is awful is that it sort of feeds into me. <laughs> when you get a role like that, you go into the departments of your soul that recognize, and that is one of the things I recognize. And I try not to uh, feed that part of my personality in day to day life. But when you get a role that gives you the chance, as you say, to lean in, to lean into it, it you know, there's a joy to it. And um, the fact that one is constantly disappointed by human nature is, is something that every rubbish day, you know, uh, the, our lovely bin men come and collect our rubbish. And every day there's someone who leaves their rubbish out on the street about half an hour after they've left. And so for me, you know, twice a week, I'm massively disappointed by uh, by humanity um and uh, and so i find lavinia very relatable in that sense but she's been massively let down by more than people who leave their rubbish on the street um and again that that's a sort of plot a plot yet to come but she has a sort of havisham-esque levels of uh of human uh disappointment behind her um and again, I think I think when you're living with a, a disability, there may be a few times a day when you you are it is demonstrated to you how kind people are, and then I think there are probably a few more times a day um, it is demonstrated to you how uninterested and selfish people are. Unfortunately. With some of these plot details that are still to come in the show, because we've only had the first half of of the first season so far, you know, and obviously in television, scripts are always still being rewritten and still forthcoming a lot of the time. How much detail did you have of what was coming for her arc-wise later on? Or did you have to construct a lot and then really think about having that openness and ability to pivot as information came your way? I I had three really, really significant pieces of information that I worked towards um, that were fully constructed into the second half of the season, which we have yet to shoot. Um, And so, yeah, I had, I had a sort of a tripod of really firm, firm things to, to get hold of. Um, And I, I think, as, I, as it went on, actually, talking to Pitt Torrance, who's a sort of fan of um, interesting and quirky thought, 
um, it's something I've always felt as well, that you very often have to explore the motives of people who are very, very charitable, um, that very often people who were running homes for fallen women may be people who judge fallen women very harshly. And, you know, we've seen in their awful revelations as to what went on in the homes for unmarried mothers in Ireland, that um, what would seem like a lovely charitable institution was in fact women being forced to behave in a way that suited the charitable. And, you know, there's a wonderful Dickensian feel to, you know, um, the, the Nevers where, you know, we're familiar with kind of do the boys hall and, and these places that were meant to be um, places of educational instruction where the people who ran them were really self-interested. And we don't know what Lavinia's reason is for being so sympathetic towards the touched. Does she want something from them? Does she want to gather them into the same place so that she can keep them under control? Um, yeah, we don't know yet what what her bottom line is, so to speak. And there's so many moments where we don't know what her bottom line is, you know, whether it is what's what's her motivation in that space going back to the conversation before about her relationship with her brother as well and so there's so much beautiful subtext to her and there's so many moments where what she's exhibiting on the surface is very different to the agenda underneath so how do you really flip and play with a character that has so much subtext to them and has so many details that you have to be able to very quietly play to without ever giving that information away fully Yes. And, you know, what's her relationship with Dr. Haig, with um, Dennis O'Hare's character? Um, you know, he, he who, who's playing whom in that situation? Um, who is using whom? For, and does she know that he he's dissecting people with a hacksaw in the background? Um, so we we don't know what's going on there yet. Um, and that's a tremendous relationship to explore you know I, when this job came up I was actually playing Elmir to Dennis O'Hare's Tartuffe on stage and um, and so we've had tremendous fun you know um, concocting what's really going on between Lavinia and uh, and Dr Haig and where they dress up as characters from from Tartuffe in their spare time. <laughs> With a lot of the work that you do, there's a really great question that I've heard that you sometimes will ask your scene partners and classmates about what is it that they need from you? Um, and so what were some of the ways in which people responded to that type of output on this project, if that was the type of conversation that you had with any of your scene partners about what they needed from you? Well, you know, uh, being rich has a has a huge um, uh, influence. So, you know, that, that is... I think one of the very few things that can overcome prejudice, be it prejudice against disability or prejudice against women, if you're the richest person in the room, weirdly, people can get over their uh, prejudices and treat you with a bit of respect. It's depressing, but it's true. And Lavinia is the richest person in the room. And so what a lot of people want from her is her money. And what that makes you do is only deal it out on your terms. And uh, um, what she needs from others um, is clearly some warmth and affection and people who don't only want her for her money. And it seems unlikely that she is going to find that. Um, but she enables and empowers um, Amalia and Penance and the Touched Women, um, what makes me and should make all of you uncomfortable is, is we don't quite know why yet. I wish, I hope it's because she is a staunch feminist, but it, it, it may not be that. <laughs> we go in either direction, we never know. I also really appreciate um, something that you've talked about in the past when it comes to reading scripts and deciding on what projects you want to take on and having to really learn to understand a lot of the subtext of the scripts that you were looking at and to really understand what's the possibility of scope, you know, what's this ultimately going to look like on screen, what's the experience of making this going to be. And it's such a huge part of an actor's job to be looking at scripts and really determining, you know, can I spend several months investing in this project? Can I stay attached to this for, you 
you know, the two, three, five years it might take for financing to come together. And so how do you feel that your ability as an actor has really evolved over the years in the way that you now look at scripts and analyse them? Uh, I wish I could say I would got better at it. Um, I still have to live with the uh, the ignominy of, of not having understood the script of The Matrix and gone, oh, I'm not sure this is one to pursue. Um, <laughs> you know, no idea. So um, I, the thing I do know now is that whenever I work and whatever the project is, I usually have a great time. And even if the movie is terrible or the people on it aren't, some people on it aren't nice, there are, I will always find the people who are nice, even if they're in accounting and uh, we'll hang out and I will have some extraordinarily good stories to tell. Um, and the worst movies make the best anecdotes. So that is my lesson to you all. <laughs> And you mentioned this briefly earlier, um, but, you know, following your own experience, you have become an ambassador for Pancreatic Cancer UK. And this isn't something where, you know, you're just posting a couple of things online about this. You've really become entrenched in it. And like you said, even rallying other people into the cause as well. And I know that there's, a, there's an upcoming campaign this month called Transform Lives Prescribe. And so I wanted to ask you about, you know, your initial relationship in this campaign and then specifically how you feel that you've been learning to utilize your voice in your platform in, in that particular way for this cause? Well, it's uh, I, I suffered from a form of pancreatic cancer. The, the most people who come across pancreatic cancer come across uh, a truly horrific condition called adenocarcinoma. And um, pretty well on the day that you find out you've got an adenocarcinoma is the is it's usually about two or three months before the day you die. And I'm not being, I'm being really blunt about that. Um, because it, it, by the time you're symptomatic, um, it will have spread all over your body. Your pancreas is incredibly hidden away in your body. And um, your amazing body, it almost makes me tearful to say it, our amazing bodies learn to live with this cancer. Um, and our minds discount the symptoms uh, until it's too late. Um, what the really important thing about this particular campaign they're doing is it's a drug that when once you found out you have cancer or, you're, or that your pancreas, pancreas isn't working, it means that you can still absorb food. It won't save your life, it will extend your life. And there is an awful thing because this cancer is so deadly, sometimes not only um, the friends and family, but the doctors give up on the people who are suffering from it. The shocking thing about it is how quickly people die and it doesn't give the family or the person time to uh, choose the death they want or to be comfortable and as comfortable as they can be. Taking this, this drug uh, means that you can absorb food. I very nearly died of starvation, not of cancer, but of starvation because my body couldn't absorb any food. And you just need to replace the enzymes that your pancreas produces when you don't have a pancreas anymore. Um, and I'm, it's just asking people to be aware that there is something that can extend your life, mean that you can absorb food and have a more comfortable time when you don't have a pancreas or as I only have half a pancreas. So I take this drug every day and it means that when I eat, I absorb the nutrients and I am the rosy cheeked, healthy 52 year old woman you see before you. Um, and um, but when I was diagnosed, the reason I was diagnosed wasn't because someone said, you've got a pancreatic tumour. It was because I was dying of starvation. And what's awful is that um, dying of starvation is a really unpleasant and awful way to die. And it doesn't have to happen like that. So uh, transform lives prescribed means don't give up on people who've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Do what you can, please doctors, to extend their life long enough for them to die comfortably in a place of their choice uh, with their loved ones around them. Uh, 
so so it's it's a it's a tough sell as a campaign there's no there's not an upside it's not a lifesaver and it doesn't involve uh children very much it involves older people and um and it, there isn't a happy ending to it um but there is a happier ending than is happening at the moment. Um, so, but yeah, the, the awful thing about my being asked and my awareness of what I could do, you know, I was asked to be an ambassador for pancreatic cancer. And I said, look, I, I've been asked to help charities before and I'm not much used because I'm not really famous enough. And, you know, if you have a sort of an auction or a dinner party in my honor, you know, there aren't that many people who are going to pay 50 grand um, to have dinner with me. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we're not asking you because you're famous. We're asking you because there are no other survivors. And um, among those people I can name, Alan Rickman, Pavarotti, Aretha Franklin, Steve Jobs, uh, you know, Steve Jobs particularly, all the money in the world couldn't save him. Um, and so I thought, get over yourself, stop being... Um, self-conscious that you can't you aren't famous enough to raise a crowd and just do what you can with the friends that you've made and you know other astounding friends have stood um, um the, you know other cast members ha have helped me who have a bigger name than I do and um Brian Cox uh, is another great actor who who put his name and made a video for me at sort of four o'clock in the morning and <laughs> in, in, uh, got out of bed and put a shirt on and stood in front of a curtain and said, help. Um, and uh, I even was persuaded, uh, it was cancelled sadly, but to, um, to do the London to Brighton bicycle ride on a Brompton bike. Brompton bikes really help um, Pancreatic Cancer UK. So I've learned, I've made friends um, with people and extraordinary people have said they will help. Well, and thank, thank you for giving us a platform. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Really, really appreciate it. And congratulations on everything with the Nevers. Very much looking forward to getting some answers in the second half of the season. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs>